This is Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast available via crappy automated YouTube closed captioning. Today we're talking about deaf representation in film and TV in light of the Oscar win for the film Coda and what it tells us about deaf culture and its connection to the mainstream. I'm Mark Lintemeyer, not deaf, but definitely kind of dumb. <laughs> I'm Sarah Lynn Breck, I'm a novelist and a writing professor. I'm Al Baker, I'm the director of research for a tech company, and I am all that you need to get by. And our special, special guest, who actually is qualified to talk about this today, <laughs> introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cambry Cruz. I'm a comedy club owner in New York City, and I wrote the memoir Burn Down the Ground about my childhood with my deaf parents and some attempted murder and some other crazy stuff. Wow. Uh, <laughs> start us off here. This film has made a big splash, but it's not the only one. There's other things with sign language and things you know coming. What is your take on this, having experienced that and... I've seen in some articles, some people complaining about like, well, you know, it's nice that deaf people are being represented, but there's still problems with we can get into with maybe the way that this is being done. Can you give us sort of your intro take on this whole thing happening now? I think it's great. I think the movie's great. I think it's great to be seen on screen and have a story that you can relate to be presented to a wider audience and know that a wider audience is paying attention. That's great. And in the comedy industry, there are more movies about stand-up comedy than any deaf person movie will ever be made. And I can tell you, it is very, very difficult for me to watch movies about stand-up comedy without just being like, oh, this is so hacky. This, is t this isn't how it is. And that's true of every industry, whether it's a police officer or courtroom scenes and things like that. You can nitpick every single thing. The more important part is that it's getting a conversation started. It's getting people interested in the culture to um, learn that there is actually a culture. It's not just a quote unquote disability, that there's a whole life out there. Al, any opening thoughts? Yeah. So what's really interesting is this second recent piece of like deaf focused culture that I've seen recently. I went to see a production of Macbeth in my hometown where a large segment of the cast was deaf and a huge part of the show was drawn from ASL. And having recently watched Coda for the first time, I wonder whether that setting or the stadium in Macbeth wasn't directly influenced by the success of Coda because there seemed to be a few similar themes that were explored between the two. I will say that having, I watched Coda for the first time just earlier today and it was first and foremost just a tremendous film there's so much to talk about and, and it is a huge achievement i think to have something which is such a landmark which seems to be such a, a landmark piece of representation for an underserved community but is also just an absolutely astounding piece of filmmaking in its own right and it is only just i guess that we americans have to speak english named after your country and you you deaf people over there have to have to sign with ASL from our country, unless they do mm, with a that's special... That's not true, actually. They have their own British Sign Language. <laughs> yeah, I can't understand British Sign Language. The Piano is a movie that uses ah. British Sign Language. No and kidding. I don't know how accurate it is, but it's a beautiful movie. But yeah, I don't understand a word she's saying. <laughs> Sarah Lynn, any opening thoughts? You got me to watch Drive My Car, which has Korean Sign Language in it. <laughs> Korean Sign Language, yeah. I, that was fascinating. And I was actually just doing a little bit of research to see if I could find any information about the actress who played the woman who signed in the movie. And there's very little about her. I wondered if she was deaf or mute. But that was fascinating, actually. And that was a whole movie partly about language and communication. And this is just the research that I've been doing before this podcast. So much of it was grounded in communication, which is something that I'm obviously as a writer, I'm fascinated with. So I actually, we watched CODA as a family and it was a really, I thought it was a very heartwarming coming of age movie. I was happy to see it win all of the awards and to see such a varied cast and to have the leads all be part of the deaf community was really exciting. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited That's to talk about this not today. not true. <laughs> the lead actress is not a coda and did not know sign language. Yeah. Right. So. But uh, three of the four leads were all 
debt. But yes, you are you are correct. Yeah, I do think that some of the criticism amongst the CODA community is that it's like, hey, how could you not have found a CODA who actually knew sign language? And you still have somebody who's learning a different language and culture. And this is supposed to be this groundbreaking work that's elevating it. So that's where some of the criticism lies. I think she did a great job and I thought it was great. But I'm sure, Al, you hear when Americans try to do a British accent, you're like, oh. <laughs> so seeing somebody who's not a native sign language speaker or sign, you're like, yeah, that's fair. a great effort. Loved it. Al appreciates when we just try to, for the whole, the whole podcast, <laughs> we just talk in that, we're, we're, like we've only heard Michael Caine. <laughs> as a former as a former colonial power, I feel like this, I've probably got less right to be salty about it. But, yeah, uh, like Eliza Doolittle. <laughs> <laughs> you go nuts. Um, <laughs> so did did Amelia Jones learn sign language for the role? And she didn't know previously. I, yeah, I think so. She learned sign language. She learned to talk in an American accent. She learned singing. She had never formally sung before. She did a fantastic job. Like I said, great. But I'm not of that ilk, the type of person to criticize that, oh, there's not a coda in this role. But that's what I do here on the coda side of things. I don't know anything about any of the the response from the, the deaf community to the film. But I did wonder watching it because obviously, everybody loves Marley. Is it Matlin has said yeah. and she's been in everything. I did wonder watching it if ever there are like deaf actors like especially deaf women actors who get annoyed. That <laughs> she gets all the roles. Maybe the, the casting directors don't know that there's more than one, uh, <laughs> more than one deaf actor in the world. Well, and that's actually part of what's great about this movie. It shows that there are multiple. Lauren Ridloff is in a Marvel movie, and she's been in tons of movies. And um, yeah, three of the things on our list today, she was like, she is the one of the Marley Matlin is is aged out of some of these roles, so she is <laughs> getting all of them. And it's been interesting seeing deaf representation in, you know, not in lead roles necessarily, but in smaller roles in Fargo. Two of the seasons, I think, featured a deaf actor. And then Only Murders in the Building this past season had American Sign Language. And I just thought that was such an interesting, and it wasn't, the focus wasn't about the character being deaf so much as this is just how these people communicate. I appreciated that, that it wasn't about the struggle or how being deaf is a quote unquote deficit, because it's not. I enjoyed seeing that kind of representation. And it's not uh, inspiration porn, which really ticks me off. I, I hate inspiration porn so hard. Going back to Fargo, Russell Harvard, who played in that, was recently in Death of a Salesman. No, sorry, To Kill a Mockingbird on Broadway. And he played a role as a, you know, because he is deaf, he signed it, but it was just never discussed. It was not part of his character development or anything. It was just that he just happened to use sign language and everyone worked around him and it was fantastic. And he was amazing in the role. He was great on Fargo. He, I, he's a friend of mine. So I'm like, I, I love Russell. So, oh, that's so yeah. Great. Also, it was not a deaf production. Going back to Al, you had mentioned this production of Macbeth. I'm curious, was it, we have deaf West theater here in the States. I'm not sure what the equivalent is there. I don't think it was a, a specialist production company. I think it was just a, a, from the rep company. And I've no idea what the motivation was for doing that. It was really super. It was one of the best stations of Macbeth I've ever seen. And it partly because of the use of sound that they made, especially in the absence of being able to use so much of the dialogue. And it was, yeah, it was, it was really, really amazing. What you're describing of To Kill a Mockingbird thing, that sounds like a... So Drive My Car is this Japanese film based on a Murakami short story that I had read. It was three hours long, and this is only a short one element in it. But it, the idea is the guy directs a play, and there are somebody speaking English, somebody speaking Korean, somebody speaking Japanese, some, some speaking Mandarin, and Korean sign language, and just never acknowledging that. That, like, we're going to rehearse it in such a way that this weird method of, like, we're just going to read the lines very deadpan and get used to hearing the languages go around that way. And so you can get your cues, even though you can't literally understand the individual words that every single other person is saying, but you know what the content of the script is as a whole. And then we're just going to, in the performance, we'll use subtitles or whatever projected, but just, it kind of is an expansion of people complain about forced representation as taking away the realism. Like, why are you making this family? It should be very insular or something. I was, I think I had brought up the wheel of time thing where it's like centers on a small rural town in this fantasy land 
where really everybody should probably look just about the same. But because this is 2022, no, it's it's super multicultural and all the groups that they run into, even though it's like you think the people from the South, the way the books are written, uh, you know, have to have darker skin and like something that reflects our experience. But we're just going to paper over that. And you know what? It's a fantasy land. And <laughs> so who cares? <laughs> like, what are you sacrificing to have this forced diversity? So it's kind of we're saying the same thing. Like, look, you're watching people on a stage perform a thing. You're going to have to suspend some disbelief. So why don't you just add the fact that we're having multiple languages or people that are supposed to be in the family that don't look anything alike or, you know, just be inclusive and say what you're sacrificing to be inclusive is not the thing that would keep you from disappearing into that magical world and enjoying the fiction. Um, You're reminding me of Bridgerton, which does not have Uh any disabled uh, representation in it that I can recall. But um, it's just it's just. (laughs) But. <laughs> it's not discussed because it's not part of the, the plot is there's this dude who likes this lady and they can't be together and oh will they get together that's the crux of it it's a love story and it doesn't matter none of it matters it's all pretend they also didn't wear those and it's all about our audience too they're considering like because i just watched children of a lesser god yesterday for the first time and the william hurt character is hearing and the marley matlin character is not and she signs and Every time they would sign, he would repeat it out loud. And it was just so bizarre. I was just thinking, oh my gosh, this is, you know, a movie that features so many wonderful deaf actors and it's a movie that's not for them. Like, why wouldn't they put subtitles in? This is 1986. It's a play adaptation, I think, because it's the play adaptation. And so for the play purposes, you kind of have to have or had to have that. I think now we have live captioning and, uh, and plays and stuff, so you could avoid that. But at the time of the writing it, uh, yeah, I think that was the challenge was, well, how does the audience know what she's saying? So right. he's the device. But yes, it's from his uh, vantage point it's as a result. It's from his vantage point. Yeah, exactly. And that's another complaint from the CODA communities, deaf communities, is that, yes, you're telling this deaf story, but you're telling it from the hearing person's point of view. And it's like, well, much like with my book, it's, well, it is from my point of view. So I am the one telling it. So I'm telling it from the point of view of a coda of what it's like to be a coda in this deaf world. But that said, I also feel like I'm deaf, capital D deaf, because I, my first language and my first culture is deaf culture and sign language. And so it feels like I'm a, sometimes I feel like I'm or used to, mostly used to, not so much anymore, feel like I'm some sort of representative that I've got to make sure to represent the deaf community and stand up for the deaf community when I see slights and things like that. So I'm curious, what did you think of these pieces being written by hearing writers? Uh, About CODA? About CODA and about Children of Lesser God. Like so many of these movies and plays are written by people who are not part of the community. That's the frustration, but it's also because, you know, my book has been optioned multiple times for a movie, and it's definitely a much more in-depth look of uh, deaf culture, some, a harder look at it, you know, where we're talking about alcoholism and domestic violence and, you know, the darker side of being part of a hidden community and the isolation and all that. So it's like, well, dang it, I wanted my story to be told. And it's much more in-depth and complicated and nuanced than this kind of sugar-coated and, you know, lighthearted, feel-good movie. But I feel like if my movie had come out first, that's not necessarily the way you want to introduce the hearing community to the deaf community. So I'm actually kind of grateful that you've got this really nice, very good family-oriented film about deaf culture and everything. So then if mine ever does get made, then we can talk about some of the darker stuff and not feel like I'm ruining the reputation of a whole community based on my one experience. It's a lot of pressure. (laughs) It is a lot of pressure. There are a couple of really different ways that the representation issue can go, which often get run together, which I think what we just talked about points to. But the, the question of like whether, say, deaf representation in film against the idea of having film or art made for that community. And it seemed very clearly that like, Coda was clearly a good piece of representation of the deaf community, even though like, the, the story was told from the story was clearly about the Coda and not the deaf community at all. 
Yeah, I thought the sound of metal was phenomenal, phenomenal, and a really great look into what it's a late deafened adult experience and him realizing like, oh, there's this whole community and I don't really fit into it, but I love them and they're accepting me. And I am, I guess, part of them now because I can't hear, but I don't want this. I want my old life back. And that struggle, I thought it was just phenomenal. And that had a lot of deaf actors and CODA actors. Paul Racy is a CODA. But not the lead. (laughs) Uh, Not the lead, but I thought he did a bang up job. I, I was really thrilled with him and Lauren Ridloff again was in it. Erica, my often co-host on this show, had played something on in some theater piece where she was someone who's going deaf and was questioning whether like, should somebody who is not deaf be doing that? But if you're playing both, I mean, I guess if you're somebody that became deaf as an adult and you could fake yeah. it, fake the hearing, as opposed to the hearing person faking the deaf, like, I guess it could go either way. It kind of depends on the level of deafness and verbal skills. So if you could play the hearing version. Or you could ask the audience to just suspend disbelief about that part oh, yeah, rather than dis- right. suspending it like, <laughs> I actually true. believe that you're a person in a wheelchair, even though you're not, or, you know, or, or a person who's deaf. <laughs> like, yes, I just watched uh, Sound of Metal today. Oh, yeah. Cause, like, I better, I better fit this in. And I, I'm so glad I did because it really without spoiling the end or whatever, like is a real, this guy can actually choose in a way, which community am I going to be part of? And like actually making you sympathize because I think too often my reaction as a hearing person, when I hear like, Oh, you know, it's not a deficit. It's not a handicap is I would still be super bummed if I lost my hearing. So much of what I do is related to that. Or, you know, if my child was born deaf, like it would be hard to not see that as something. And when you say that, you're talking about cochlear implants. Cochlear implants, yeah, they used to be much more controversial. When they were first, the technology first came about, it was very frightening for the deaf community. My parents were very adamantly opposed to it. Or not my dad. My, mo- my dad wanted one. My mom and her family, my mom's family is generationally deaf. And so definitely adamantly opposed to anything that would basically wipe out their language and their culture is what they envisioned the future would hold. And they're not wrong in thinking that because most, I don't want to say most, I don't know the statistics, but kids who get cochlear implants as babies are 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. So 90% of these babies, if they're born into a hearing family and they have the means and the ability to get cochlear implants and get them, but they're in a hearing family, they don't know sign language. And so that culture is taken away from the kid the kid has no language in case these cochlear implants fail or they decide they don't want one growing up later in life. And they don't always work. And so I think they're knock on wood. I don't know why I'm saying this. Hang on, knock on wood. Hopefully sign language will always be around. And I started to say, well, why am I wanting that? And it's because it's my culture. It's my life. (laughs) Sign language is my identity. Deaf culture is my identity. And without it, it's like, oh, who am I? So, I, you know, I want sign language to always exist, even though I think, you know, people wouldn't necessarily want. I'm struggling to find the words because I'm emotional about it. But, you know, I'm going to connect that to a theme in Coda, because I thought something really interesting about that film was the particular setting that they decided to set it in. And I haven't yet decided exactly what I think the thinking behind that was, but like the fishing community, right? A generational way of living, which maybe doesn't have a kind of technological or particularly good economic reason for existing anymore, but there is still a really strong cultural need for it in those particular communities. And just hearing you talk about that right now, I wonder if something like that wasn't the thinking behind setting Coder in that particular film. Like a, a, a very particular community and way of living tied to something that, generationally like generations ago people would have had no choice in whether to do that or not now they do and the film is like asking the question about that community like does it need to be as clearly not working how it used to does it need to be here and like it gives a good answer to that rooted in like good feelings i think the connections are really interesting yeah you're making me remember a bunch of different culturally interesting or niche things about the 70s and maybe earlier, actually. Bowling is very big in the deaf community or used to be, and I'm not sure how much it is now, but bowling is one of these activities where everyone could do it. 
we had a family friend, he was deaf and he had two hooks for hands. His hands were severed as an adult. And it's just one of the most traumatic things you can imagine happening to a deaf person, like taking away his language. But then he had these hooks and he learned how to use sign language and he bowled with his hooks. And so (laughs) we have like all these different, it didn't matter age and physical capabilities, almost everyone could participate in it. And it was really loud and social. And it didn't matter how loud it was. And yeah, it's just one of those things that the deaf community really gravitated towards. And also fishing was a big thing. And for work, I don't know about in other regions of the country, but most of my family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, all of my deaf family, they all worked in electronics. And it was work that they could do solo with clear instructions without any interference. And yeah, my mom wired helicopters and my dad and uh, grandma, my grandparents, my mom's parents, they all worked at different electronics companies doing all kinds of wild electronic stuff. So weird niche. I love that connection that you made out about the two communities. They've got the deaf community as well as the fishing community. And it seemed like in Coda and Tell me if I got this wrong, but it seemed like the daughter was the link there between the family and the fishing community. And I wondered, we had read a couple of articles that were critical of CODA and about how they were, about, the, about how the deaf people in the family were so dependent on her. And in, in most situations, they're not as, they're far more independent or they have other resources other than their hearing child to help them. And I was just sort of wondering, because they did, they were so invested in in both communities, which I appreciated, but it just seemed like, oh, does the link have to be the CODA? I don't know. What do you think about that? With technology today, I just don't think that that would be the case. My dad, he was in prison for 20 years and he was about to get out of prison July during the pandemic. And so I was having conversations with him about like, you're a time traveler, dude, you're going to come out of prison. And it's like Rip Van Winkle, you've woken up from a 20 year nap and you're in the future, dude. Things are different and you're not going to be isolated. We're very excited. The very first thing I was going to teach him was how to clear his browser history on his laptop. And that was like item number one. He wanted to know what Snapchat was and things like that. I'm like, oh, gosh, we're in trouble here. But with all that technology, texting and live captioning and everything, yeah, you, you don't need to rely on a coda as long as you've got an iPhone, you know, smartphone. Maybe that was a pragmatic reason for setting it in a kind of old fashioned community. And impoverished, maybe a little bit, or with people who aren't like, who don't care about Facebook and things, you know, more off the grid. Yeah. Very I mean, much, yeah. that did create good tension, you know, from a story perspective, it was great for the plot. But I also wasn't sure, you know, just reading since then, I, it doesn't seem like this is as typical as was presented. Yeah, my <laughs> dad uh, would handwrite and, and he had many, many, many hearing friends and they would either learn sign language and or they would use paper notes to communicate. And if he's capable of using paper notes and creating deep, real relationships with people this way, then texting back and forth, he's golden. So, Is Mr. Holland's opus. So the end of that is music teacher. And it's all about his love of music. And, you know, he's not going to be a professional musician. He's going to use it to inspire. It's, it's definitely inspiration porn. But then his child is deaf. And so the climax of the movie is the tragedy is, is the climax of the movie is like he organizes a concert or at least one of the important parts is he organizes a concert that involves lights. And so it's just it's like some of those things in Children of Lesser God, the where the mm-hmm. teacher is trying to show the deaf students like, hey, music is a thing that you can get into too. just put your hands on the speaker and groove to the, you know, and in this case, colorful lights and things. And that was a way or put your hand on someone's throat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was supposedly a way for this guy to connect, you know, who's so music is his life to connect with his child who maybe is a teenager. I don't remember in the film, but, you know, is old enough that actually the issue of having a relationship and having something in common, being able to, you know, matters. So I just I wasn't sure whether what seemed problematic about that, which is it's a tragedy that we have to overcome if that is what Coda is done more delicately with an actual, you know, deaf community and making it more of like the central focus of the theme. But it still is this, is there something wrong with a tragedy about somebody who's really into music 
loving some people Having, who are deaf. Right. Or is right. that just a, like that a human experience this, that you know, we should a, be it's relating? A, it's a real human yeah. experience. Yeah. That this thing that I love so much, you can't enjoy it the way that I enjoy it. And therefore, it makes me hurt for you. Like you've lost something or whatever. And it's like, well, they can enjoy it. It's just not in the same way that you can. And it's okay if we enjoy things differently. I love all sorts of things that my husband and my family don't <laughs> love. And I just, I share it with them and they're, they're like, thanks. Good, good, good job. Camry. I guess that it, it's his life calling music is his life calling. And then he's given this deaf child by God. I don't know. I'm thinking about the uh, only murders in the bu- building and Nathan, wait, who, Lane, Nathan, Lane. Nathan Lane's, mm-hmm. ca- well, I don't remember his character's name, but I thought that was really well done showing how this hearing father is very desperately upset and angry and in emotional turmoil about his son being deaf. And I'm sure most, many parents have gone through that emotional roller coaster as well, if, if they're not of the deaf culture, especially. And solving it with jewel thievery. But I love the other side of that, too. I think Marley Matlin in both Coda and in Children of a Lesser God talked about having deaf children and how that would be a joy, a positive for her. Yeah, my mom and her family were very disappointed that I could hear. <laughs> my dad was thrilled. He tested it out right away. Like he like screamed at me when I was a baby. Just like, OK, she can, she's good. But yeah, my mom and her family definitely would have liked me to be deaf. But that said, my mom was born with partial hearing and became gradually deafer as she grew up and went to deaf school, I think, by the time she was a teenager, absolutely, maybe even younger. And her deaf parents absolutely used her as their mouthpiece and um, right-hand man and relied very, very heavily on her. That said, she was born in 1947, so we're talking about the 50s and 60s, so much technology that was not even thought about at the time, and no provisions made or exceptions or any kind of help or assistance or anything. So they very, very much were dependent on her. So as much as they probably would have liked for their grandkids to have been deaf, it's like you definitely benefited from having a coda in the family. And they didn't want her to go to college so that she could stay home with them and be close with them. And so kind of dashed her college dreams and stuff. And so there was some resentment and some what could have been that I think my mom had for a long time. And that push to assimilate that we saw in previous works, like again, I keep going back to Children of Lesser God, but that push to assimilate, enjoy the things that everybody else does instead of this is a community that is worthy and valid and and exciting and has its own benefits that you guys don't get. That's something that was eye-opening for me to see because I feel like so much of what we've been exposed to in the media has been about, you know, how can we assimilate. It's not even just the deaf community. It's how do we assimilate these others into this larger. Right. And that's why I mentioned the bowling tournaments and the bowling community, uh, because it was just a very specifically deaf thing. Of course, lots of people bowl, but the deaf community bowled, you know, and deaf tournaments, it was just a part of your whole deaf experience revolved around these different tournaments. Fishing and bowling in particular are the two that really my family gravitated towards. There was actually a news channel. They came out and filmed a piece and talked with my mom on camera. And it was kind of a big deal at the bowling alley that day because it was the national deaf bowling tournament. So it was like all the different winners from all over the country had assembled. And I think it was either in Dallas, Fort Worth or or somewhere in Oklahoma, but it was like a big national deal. And so the, there was news teams that came out and covered it, and they just couldn't believe that. Like, there's this whole world happening right under our noses, and you hearing people, get a load of this. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bowling, who knew? I wonder what it is about bowling. Well, because it's very social. You can drink and smoke. Well, you used to be able to smoke inside, and that was, um, you know, Every deaf person I knew smoked and drank, so I I not know if I'm a good CODA example. (laughs) 
and it was very social, but also, again, going back to different levels of disability could participate in it. My grandmother, she was in her 60s and was bowling right alongside all these younger deaf people. And so it, it was inclusive. It was very inclusive. Of course, the man with the hooks, I am still fascinated to this day. And I'm like, I, ple- I need to meet somebody present day. He's passed away. But I want to meet somebody present day who has those hook attachments because I want to know how that worked. He like hit a lever or something and the ball shot off and he was a really great bowler. Really neat. That's fascinating. (laughs) Yeah, it really is. I mean, sort of just relating this to wider disability representation that deafness is more than some other ways of, I don't want to say ways of being disabled, but that's the at least the way the law, you know, American Disabilities Act, the fact that you could have a deaf community. Can you have a amputee community or something? Like I've, we've, oh, I've yeah, read I've, articles about amputee. Facebook has shown me there's a group for everybody. Okay. I mean, I've read articles <laughs> about amputee representation or something, but it's not like that affects your life so fundamentally that like amputees gather together and have an amputee community. Yeah, I could see having an annual conference uh-huh. to talk about new technology and things like that. But yeah, that where it, and unless you're maybe a, one of the disability advocates, I do have a a bunch of blind friends who the blind and the deaf don't necessarily intermingle for, I guess, obvious reasons. But then there's the deaf blind community that's kind of like stuck in there in the Venn Venn diagram of it all. But in my childhood and growing up in my CODA and deaf communities, there were multiple disabilities that were represented. And I think, you know, just different birth defects. If deafness was one of them, you ended up in the deaf school and ended up in the deaf community. But there is definitely a wide range of disabilities that I grew up with, um, of people around me. I'm not thinking about the Paralympics, though, and how surprisingly easy it seems to be to find a lot of people who share a disability and also an interest in the same niche sport. (laughs) I don't think we should underestimate how easily communities will bond over Mm -hmm. like anything shared yes yeah shared experience the tv show texas with the football one of the guys becomes a paraplegic and so there's a whole like paraplegic basketball or whatever the sport is you know what he's doing instead of football that like is a significant yeah because he's still athletic Uh and he still likes the idea of competing and all that yeah i grew up in texas so when you said football (laughs) i was a drama nerd and just seeing all the money that they funneled into those stadiums and stuff is really frustrating. Yeah, I guess just to turn back for a second, that tragedy of I'm a, you know, somebody that loves music, but like somebody that loves music, but has a relative that is quote unquote tone deaf, just doesn't see much value in music. It's kind of the same tragedy. In fact, like, I can't believe that you're not as into all these. Why won't you listen to my CDs? Like, cause I just don't care. I just don't like, it's uh, just, just doesn't, yeah. I'll listen to sports radio. So let me do, let me do an, an apologia for Coda and the way they handled that. So there's that, the wonderful the recital scene, mm-hmm. right? And the, but and the way they play the tragedy isn't here's a thing and you can't appreciate it. Like here's a thing and you have no way of understanding why it's good or why it means so much to me. Yeah, why it means so much. And then in that recital scene, you have the moment that is so good, and they, they have the start of it where they're literally, but the parents are just bored and like looking around and. The, the dad's futzing with his shirt and then the way they cotton onto it is they start to see how other people are reacting and like and the power that their daughter has yeah i was um going back to being in drama in texas they turn everything into a competition in texas so i competed in one act plays and we went to state and it was the first time in the school's history that a drama team had made it to state it was a big deal and everyone came from all over But my parents, they came to every show, every play I ever did, and there was never an interpreter. Granted, the one we took to state was a farce, so it was a lot of physical comedy and everything. But I was also once in uh, Noises Off, and my deaf grandmother and grandfather, they came to see me, and they're very, very supportive. And I think they would understand enough, and my mom or somebody there would give them the info or fill in the gaps and stuff. But that's what you do. You show up for people, whether you like their music or not. Like I've gone to see some <laughs> terrible shows because my friends were in it, you know, and I want to be there. So that's just their way of showing up. And there is more to watching your child perform other than the thing that it is that they're doing. It is the effect that you can absolutely feel that energy, whether you can hear it or not, you can feel it. And that's why you go as a, as a loved one. 
as a parent who had kids who were in string programs and watching a like middle school string concert, like I'm not enjoying that as a musician. Like, oh my lord! Uh, but but it, it gains its own sort of cuteness, you know, because they're kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I'm now in my 50s, and I just came straight here from my ice skating. I just started learning how to ah. ice skate in December. So wow. three, four, five months later, <laughs> and I did a toe loop jump today. And I was like, you know what? I am absolutely going to sign up and do a recital, and I'm making everyone I know come to it. <laughs> and I'm going to get the stupidest outfit. I'm going to take pictures, like with like the baton type. Yeah. I'm like, cause what else is life other than like having fun, just doing fun things? Like, just stop taking yourself so seriously, especially with the news today and things going on in the world. It's like, we got to find some joy somewhere. So yeah, I'm going to drag them out to watch me probably fall and do something really stupid to an ACDC song. Uh (laughs) That sounds great. (laughs) Well, just, just to bring things down, you know, we haven't touched on like, let's involve deaf characters in horror. Like, let's put them in Walking Dead, put them this hush, which I had seen a while ago, but it just seems like, you know, things about uh, women being terrified by stalkers trying to break in and murder them. That's a great, let's make lots of movies about that. But what if she was deaf? Then she couldn't see if he was sneaking behind (sighs) her. But then she figures out how to kick his ass anyway. Is that good that that is represented? It just seems like it was some writer's like idea of how to put to these. To to make a twist on them. Exactly. Yeah. It seems like what you're doing there is using somebody's disability as a plot device, which is maybe not the good kind of representation. Yeah, uh, or for a gag. And that's been overrepresented in throughout <laughs> the decades. Yeah, I had had the idea to write a horror movie because I have a cabin in the woods that's got a trap door and it's just like ripe for a setting. So I had drafted in my head the idea of a horror movie, but it's a bunch of middle-aged people because all the horror movies are always these really young teenage or 20 somethings and they all get naked and stuff. And I'm like, what if it's just a whole bunch of middle-agers and the things that either save them from the killer or what does them in is like their bum knee or their hearing aid starts ringing when they're trying to hide and their hearing aid battery goes off and stuff like that. But there was going to be some deaf humor in there, but from the point of view of like, you don't realize the killer's behind you. And so you turn around and like whack him in the head accidentally be- and you get away because you're deaf and you didn't know. And oh shit, I'm sorry. No. Wait, is, it, was that a Mr. Magoo <laughs> adaptation? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mr. Magoo, there's blind representation there, but it was very much gag. Yeah. I'm not kicking myself for not suggesting that we all rewatch See No Evil, Hear No Evil. I, I, I have that pulled up on well. my screen right now because I was when, <laughs> when Cambry mentioned using it for comedic effect or whatever. Richard Pryor yeah. and uh, Gene Wilder. That was a great movie. I loved that <laughs> one when I was a kid. Yeah. I saw it when I was a kid. So now like it with the different lens, you yeah. know, different. Does it uh, hold I was, I was going to ask what, what status does that have in the deaf community? Because it's like not very good at representation and, you know, doesn't have a particularly sophisticated or nuanced view of either the deaf or blind experience, I assume. But it's a great movie. I thought it was funny as a kid, but again, I don't know how I would feel about it at this age and knowing what did my parents think of it. I don't know. I do know my dad had a friend, my friend Carrie, her dad could not read or write. And my dad was deaf. And so he wanted to use notes. And so they had a whole communication issue. And it became kind of like a see no evil, hear no evil kind of gag thing between the two of them. I was like, well, you're clearly going to have to learn sign language because you can't read. So you're going to either have to learn a new language or you're going to finally have to learn how to read, and write, which is going to be. So he learned sign language. In The Quiet Place, that was actually their superpower was ASL. Sign language never goes out of fashion as if we are invaded by alien monsters who are That's attracted it. to sound and kill you if you make any sound. But Yeah, so everyone can have cochlear implants, but you're still going to need to know sign being language. Being deaf, though, you might make sound and not know it. So <laughs> Right. Oh my gosh, yes, true. Oh, I have stories. <laughs> <laughs> the gag of the loud sex in Coda. I mean what Uh yeah, that's why I can't watch the Smurfs again. Every Saturday morning. <laughs> no matter how loud I turned up the Smurfs. <sighs> <laughs> it is hacky a little bit to show it, but it's true. I mean, it's absolutely true. I do think so they got a little criticism about the doctor's visit, you know, that there would normally right. be an interpreter mm-hmm. there. 
in an ideal situation, obviously, yes, there would be an interpreter there. But oftentimes, there's not one. They've got a job. They've got a life. They can't just drop everything. They've got to go see the doctor. So it's sometimes easier, or more convenient to either not have an interpreter or to bring along a coda or somebody like that, or even a friend. I wonder that about the scene when they, they got nabbed by the Coast Guard. Like it's obviously played up for maximum trauma, but these people would have realized that these people were deaf. There would have been that have something to point to. I know multiple deaf people, one who's now since passed, but have gotten beat up by the police or shot at, killed because of uh, misunderstandings with police officers and the law and stuff. But I'm um, going back to that doctor's visit, though. It is definitely played up, like you said, for comedic effect or for tension or drama or whatever. But it is stuff that happens. Um, my dad, when he was on his deathbed, he was in prison and they did not have an interpreter. And I had to tell him that he was dying. And the doctors insisted, oh, no, we told him when we explained it to him. And I'm like, yeah, he didn't know. And I just I had to tell him, do you have an interpreter there? oh, no, we don't have it because of COVID. Everything was COVID related and everything. So it absolutely happens even in the worst situations. And definitely if it's just some sort of weird STD or, or itch or jock itch or something like that, then yeah, you're not always going to have a, an interpreter there. But it does go back to that conversation they were having at the dinner table with the son and his Twitter or Tinder or something profile. I'm sure this is a broad stroke, but in my deaf experience. Deaf people are very blunt. And so things about sex and body image and all that stuff, it is not sugar-coated and it is very, very blunt. So it's kind of a running joke amongst my codas, just, oh, that deaf bluntness that's coming out in you whenever you say something that's just really a little on the nose and just you didn't tone it down for somebody's feelings. That's the deaf bluntness. So, yeah, I thought they did that really well, even though it does come across a little hacky and stuff. But Yeah, as you say, if humor is supposed to, even though, again, it's fiction, you have to forget that you're watching people on a screen. There's, it's okay to introduce some sort of artificiality to keep things in a politically desirable direction. But you also, what actually makes it effective is whether it's, it's something that actually happens or it seems like it could happen, that you mentioned Bridgerton before. I feel like that is so over-engineered to be... You know, have people say, so I'm thinking in particular, if you saw the last season where sort of the younger sister who's been moved around like an object and she comes out like, I'm going to do what I want. Like there were some discussions about feminism and like what would the, the, the exact most strong thing that she could say, because we will really want to represent women and, you know, minority women who may be in this, you know, placed in these situations where they're being moved around against their will. We want to show justice being done to that situation in such a way that like, I mean, perhaps it, it has roots in people's actual experiences. Like that's why we feel like this is representing something that we want to see overcome on screen, but was not like the scene we're discussing, like something sort of slice of life. It was a political, it was something, a political message rather than a piece of reflective fiction, which just seemed like that those don't necessarily go together very well. Yeah. Bridgerton's not being historically accurate. I hope they don't go too far down that point. I'm, I'm watching it for the costumes and the sex. <laughs> and well, it's not, it's not outlander level of sex here, but you know, this sexual tension. But there's also lots of different types of those kinds of stories, right? There are lots mm -hmm. of historical romances to choose from, whereas there are far fewer stories about the deaf community to choose from, which is why we keep picking on CODA. But, you know, like you said before, you know, it's just, it's a family movie. It's a sweet movie. It's a coming of age movie. And hopefully there'll be lots, you know, to choose from, including yours. Yeah, it opened up the doors, hopefully. I think so. I, I thought Switched at Birth might do that. The TV show Switched at Birth. Oh, right. but, but I think CODA, especially winning Oscars, I mean, come on, that's it. That's the pinnacle. That's the best you can do. So that is groundbreaking and that will open up doors to have more nuanced and, and deeper conversations and more dramatic uh, tellings. And there was never a moment when CODA came out or and was getting so many, many accolades and everything. There was never a moment where I was like, oh, man, I'm jealous or frustrated. Like, oh, they've told my story. Now I can't tell mine because there's 
always a different point of view and there's always a different experience. And I had this experience whenever I was writing my book or even before I had written the proposal for it, a friend had recommended The Glass Castle, the book, The Glass Castle. And yeah. and now, of course, it's like a crazy bestseller. At the time, it was still fairly new. And so she wanted to take me to a party glamour or one of these magazines was honoring Jeanette Walls with the woman of the year. And so she invited me to go meet her and gave me her book to read it. And afterwards, I read it, loved it, thought it was the most amazing thing, met Jeanette. She was so lovely. And I told my husband afterwards, I was like, well, that was great, but now I can't, I can't write my book. And he was like, what? What are you talking about? I was like, well, she did it. She's written my story and she did it so beautifully. And I feel like I, I can't tell my story now. And he's like, Cambry, her family was deaf and her dad tried to kill her mother? And I was like, well, no. And he's like, okay, then she hasn't told your story. So you can still tell your story. So it feels like with CODA, any kind of, I've heard a little rumblings like, oh, well, they've done this and it wasn't even from a CODA's point of view. Now a real CODA can't tell it. And it's like, no, 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 no. There's always a different point of view. There's always your experience and your story is unique because it's you telling it. So there's room for more. That's that's exactly right. And hopefully now people will will want to fund it. <laughs> and are you going to get to narrate it as an adult, like in the Wonder Years and be like... Oh. Uh, you know, I, it, we don't even have a screen play for it. The book has been optioned multiple times by two different people. One person has optioned it three times. They have currently have the option now. The other person was a screenwriter or is a screenwriter and just they got other projects and just never had the time to do something on spec really without pay. And you're, as long as you're getting paid to do these other things, that's always sitting on the back burner, but we'll see. Maybe if you just add some, that you were discovering the wizarding world as part of the, your growing up, if you just add a little element of that, then it would be more attractive <laughs> to adapters. <laughs> <laughs> or there's, it opens up in a bowling, with the bowling scene. Bowling needs to make a comeback. Just like roller skating's coming back, we need some bowling. To bowling, come. yeah. And maybe a palace. I think mm-hmm. if, all right, beautiful clothes. if I have a bowling community uh, <laughs> episode here, you can come back for <laughs> to talk about that. <laughs> uh, it seems like a whole thing that people are into. <laughs> I just went bowling last night. Uh, it was so cool. oh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> can we kind of go around one more time? Do we have like a final recommendation, a point you wanted to finish? Cambry, did you have a, a is there a better thing <laughs> that people should be looking at instead of or in addition to Coda? I do just hope that this does open the doors Mm -hmm. for more stories to be told. Obviously, I would love it if mine ever made the screen. But honestly, I'm pretty pleased with the book and how well it's done. And I I had an ache and a need to tell my story and I told it. And so I don't have that ache anymore, especially since my dad has passed. But I do think that deaf theater has always had a really strong, strong presence and a strong community. I think moving to the screen is a natural and long overdue transition because that's where you're going to meet a wider audience of the hearing community and just raising awareness of the community itself. But then also just to create new art for the deaf community because we deserve art too, you know? And I think that's why deaf theater has always done so well because sign language naturally just needs to be seen. And so deaf theater has always had a strong presence in the deaf community, but it's nice to see it on this, on the screen. It's really, really nice. And I don't know if it's just a matter of like doing the weird thing that we do with this podcast, but I like at least sometimes seeing stuff that is not aimed at me, like that you get the feeling of that you're spying on, like, this is the real stuff. Like if I watch <laughs> certain, certain Asian movie, you know, the drive my car or something like that was, that was not aimed specifically at me. That was like, I'm seeing Japan through, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I went and saw this Icelandic uh, singer. He won or he came in third in Eurovision or something. And I went to his concert and I was like, I am not in this kid's target demo. He's like 20 something pansexual, whatever. And I'm like, I'm going to be the oldest person there. There were so many people so much older than me. It was fantastic. But I, that's how I feel when I'm listening to his music and watching his videos. I'm like, you did not have <laughs> this middle-aged white lady in mind when you wrote this. But here I am, and I love what you're doing. <laughs> Al, did you have a, a final thought or recommendation or something? No further recommendation. I would just say again that I thought Coda was terrific. 
in its own right as a movie and is we're still in an age where rather the age that we're in now Hollywood knows that it needs to do representation but is not good at doing it well and I think Coda was a real landmark in how to in how to manage representation while making a really good film and really, making money too and making money in a really good way it was successful yeah. all the way around like the Oscars show it the box office showed it the critic scores are in, insane yeah it's a real achievement well, I'm going to interpret what you just said as a strong recommendation for Eternals. Okay, so go on, Sarah Lynn. Absolutely. <laughs> Sarah Lynn, did you have a final thought? You know, I just kind of want to echo what Alan Cambry have said. Just, I, I'm excited to see how it, this kind of representation it evolves. And I would love to see more uh, represent, representation behind the camera. You know, I think having writers and directors and people who, are, who really truly understand these experiences I think that's probably our next step is I, I would love to see that more. And, and that includes CODAs too. I think I would like to see people who are already steeped in these communities and this experience seeing that reflected on screen. All right. Well, thanks to all of you. We're going to keep talking and maybe hear more about Cambry's book at patreon.com slash pretty much pop. You can go support us for a small amount there to get that wonderful content. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for being on the panel and to the deaf community. <laughs> We're waving our hand. <laughs> so long. Get more Pretty Much Pop at prettymuchpop.com. Get bonus content for every episode at patreon.com slash prettymuchpop. You can also now get all the bonus content directly through Apple Podcasts by signing up for a paid subscription there, which gets you ad-free episodes and extra talking not only for Pretty Much Pop, but also for my other podcasts, Nakedly Examined Music and Philosophy vs. Improv. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life Podcast Network, and it's also presented by OpenCulture.com.